Apple spacecraft that will deliberately crash into an asteroid is preparing to launch. NASA's DART mission will lift off on November the 23rd aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from California. Joining me now live is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, good afternoon. I mean, the prospect of deliberately crashing, <laughs> I, it sounds a bit scary. Why is it deliberately crashing into an asteroid? Yeah, it's not the sort of thing that said, hey, let's go build this and then just <laughs> crash it on purpose. Exactly. But it is, it is for good use. So the whole mission of DART is to test the ability to redirect an asteroid. So this is kind of quite literally bringing the idea of Hollywood movies or Begeden Deep Impact into real life. So if we have an asteroid headed for the Earth, what could we do to deflect it? Well, the idea is if you give something a, a nudge far away enough that it will sail past uh, the Earth and will be safe. So DART, as you said, will be launched next month and it'll go to a binary asteroid. And then around September next year, after it reaches there, it will shoot and essentially crash at one of two asteroids. There's two asteroids orbiting around each other. It will shoot at one, crash into it, and it will the a, a measuring device on a second one will essentially see how much uh, shift or how much of the impact it made to see does it cause enough deflection essentially so that in the future we could use this technique to essentially safeguard the Earth from an asteroid. And has this asteroid been chosen in particular or it really doesn't matter which one it is? So one of the reasons this one was chosen, there, there's no threat or anything like that. Um, it's relatively nearby, so it's easy to get to. We don't have to wait for five years. Uh, and there's two of them. So because if we just hit one asteroid, it'd be hard to measure the exact impact. But by having two orbiting around and only hitting one, you can measure the change of that asteroid with respect to the other. So we have a good baseline to measure how well we can essentially deflect uh, an asteroid. So this is one of the reasons it was chosen. And then practically, once those two goals were met, it's kind of, all right, well, this is an easy one to get to. So it's easy and it's a good way to measure it. Um, but again, it doesn't pose a problem, but it's nice to be able to test your backup plan before we need it in the future. And that's why they're eager to get this test done. Absolutely. So better to be safe than sorry, that's, that's right. for sure. Now, Brad, China is entering the space tourism business with launches set for 2024. I mean, I guess if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> you know, we've talked a lot about Bezos and Branson and Musk and all of these different missions happening. Not surprised that China, which has a very big space program going on, a lot of people do not realise that China... Uh, last year, and I think this year, is on track to have the most rocket launches as a country. So definitely beating the US and Russia, not something you really appreciate. So not surprising, they want to enter the private space game. Uh, and as you saw the capsule just briefly right there, it has kind of this blue origin cross SpaceX look. Uh, now, through US rules, uh, China is not allowed to participate in US space programs. Now, that doesn't prevent private companies from allowing Chinese citizens or China to participate. But given a lot of these U.S. companies get contracts from NASA, there's kind of a heavy burden there for them not to participate. And clearly, we know China has a large population willing to spend money uh, at times. So not surprising, as you said, that they will join the space game. And if they aim for 2024 launch, as we've seen in the past year, that goal can definitely be achieved by companies to uh, send their tourists up. Absolutely. And it's interesting because, as you said, it's like they've drawn inspiration from Blue Origin and SpaceX. They've taken basically their capsule from another. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, I think this is going to be something that we start to see. You know, we focus a lot on these three companies now, but now that this industry exists and people know, all right, well, this model works or this design works, much like airplanes and, and, and airliners and car manufacturers, you can use designs do improvements and use it for what you need to do. And I think we're going to see a lot of that in the future with China entering that game. I wouldn't be surprised if other countries enter the private space race game or even we get at more U.S. or maybe even Australian companies that do this. So I think this is not the end, but definitely the beginning of this who can send the most tourists up into space. <laughs> well, there's a whole world ready to be explored, that's, that's right. for sure. Now, Brad, Pluto's atmosphere is starting to disappear. Why? Yeah, so this has been quite of an interesting thing. When, when New Horizons went past uh, Pluto back in 2015, uh, it really showed that Pluto had quite a thick 
uh, atmosphere for being as far away as it is. Now, it was icy, but it had fog. But it does appear to, based on the dynamics of the planet, so how much mass, how much gravity, and the fact that these cold temperatures that Pluto has, uh, you know, obviously it's so far away from the sun, that its not, its ability to hold on to its atmosphere isn't necessarily as strong as, say, uh, some of the more inner planets. So it appears that even though this was a surprise that Pluto had an atmosphere, the fact that it is so far out and it is a dwarf planet, not that it has anything to do with its size, but it's just smaller, meaning there's less gravity to hold on to that atmosphere, meaning that over time, uh, it's losing its atmosphere. So whether it will completely disappear or not, we do not know. Whether Pluto had a thicker atmosphere in the, in the past, if it has a thinner atmosphere now, maybe it had more in the past, uh, we do not know. So Pluto keeps having surprises every time we study it. Yeah, fascinating. And the UAE, Brad, is planning a mission to Venus and to land on an asteroid. How difficult will this be? Look, it's going to be tricky, and this would make them only the fourth country to land on an asteroid. We saw Hayabusa 2, uh, which was Japan, and Australia's uh, mission do this uh, about a year and a half ago, and we've seen NASA do it. So in order to do this, they would go into the solar system, do this flyby by Venus, getting images uh, and data, use the gravity of Venus to slingshot it back out, kind of throw it back into the solar system. Now, that gets it a lot of speed. And then if you do another maneuver past Earth, you can pick up a little bit more speed and then slingshot really fast the asteroid belt, which is actually quite far away. We picture the asteroid belt as being really close, but it still can take years to get there. Then reach the asteroid belt and land on it to take samples. And this is the big game, uh, landing on these places to take samples and ideally return them back to the Earth. It's no longer just adequate to go visit or take images. We want to take stuff from there and take it back to the Earth because we can do a lot more study in detail here. And as we've seen with the UAE and their mission to Mars, they're really growing their space program. So it's not a surprise they're make, they've made this big announcement. And if they want to do this by 2028, as we've seen with their Mars mission, we expect them to reach that deadline. They're a, they're a, a big, successful group there. Yeah, fascinating. And uh, as I said, a huge world out there that's just waiting to be discovered. Brad Tucker, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Take care.